morning again, everyone. You're very welcome to the Charlotte Christian Fellowship. I'm just going to pray for God's word before we begin. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask, Lord, please, that you would speak to us through your living and active word. We ask, Father, that in Jesus' name, your word would do its work in our lives. Whether it's us, Lord God, who are here in this hall this morning, or people watching in on Facebook or YouTube, people watching, Lord God, in other parts of this country, we pray, or other parts of this world, Father, we pray that your word would do its work in their lives also, that they would be very much a part of what's going on here, but Lord, more so that they would be very conscious of your presence with them, just as we, Lord God, are conscious of your presence among us now, so we pray for them also who are watching in, that they, Lord God, would know that you are with them, and may your spirit speak into their lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, you'll be delighted to know that this is the last week on this series, The Person of the Devil and His Opposition to God and the Saints. I was saying with Nolan this morning that I was thinking, you know, maybe it would be up to about four or six weeks we'll be looking at this subject, and it's actually 21 weeks that we've been looking on this subject alone. Although we started the whole Statement of Faith series, What Shiloh Believes, in January 2019. Isn't that hard to believe? Yeah. Uh, it's taken me that long to get through it. Uh, that's grant your education for you. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I was saying last week how every born-again Christian needs to develop a be prepared for every eventuality mentality. And certainly as far as our warfare with the devil goes, we need to have that be prepared for every eventuality mentality. But not only do you need to know your enemy, which is what this series is, not only do you need to know your enemy and how he works, but as the Apostle Paul says, we also need to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And it means that our position, what Paul is basically saying, Christian, is this. When you wake up in the morning, you need to understand that your position of strength, because you're born again into a spiritual battle, the moment that you open your eyes in the morning, the Apostle Paul is saying you need to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his, of his might. You need to understand that your position of strength, the very power that is behind the weapons that God has given us, all of our strength must be found in Jesus all of our strength against our enemies, all of the strength of the powerful weapons that God has given us must be found in Jesus. Our strength against our enemies, remember our enemies are the world, the flesh, and the devil. And we cannot defeat them by ourselves. We must have our strength in Jesus. And we're further strengthened against the foe when Paul tells us we put on the whole armor of God which God gives to his children to help us resist the devil and his wicked ploys. So let me ask Christian, be very careful, don't nod your head here because I might just pick you out. <laughs> let me ask, have you, Christian, have you developed a be prepared for every eventuality mentality? Do you know your enemy? Are you standing strong in the Lord and in the power of his might? Have you, Christian, have you put on the whole armor of God? Let's read in Isaiah chapter 59. And we're starting halfway through verse 15 of Isaiah 59. Then the Lord saw it and it displeased him. What's happening here in this passage is there is so much injustice, there is so much wickedness and evil going on here that the Lord is not happy. And this is where we're breaking in. And then the Lord saw it and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his own arm brought salvation for him and his own righteousness, it sustained him. For he put on the, the righteousness, he put on righteousness as a breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, accordingly, 
he will repay. Fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. The coastlands he will fully repay. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. And then over to Ephesians chapter 6, and we're reading from verse 13, the Apostle Paul writes, Therefore take up the whole armour of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your waist, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Let me ask you a question this morning, or a few questions. Did Jesus, the Son of God, who is God become man, who is God in the flesh, did Jesus have a be prepared for every eventuality mentality? Did Jesus know his enemy? Did, he, did Jesus stand strong in the Lord and in the power of his might? Did Jesus put on the whole armour of God. You know, I've said many times uh, that there are things that we read and things that we see in the Old Testament that are shadows, they are types of things more glorious to come. And they were told to sacrifice a lamb and to sprinkle the blood on the doorposts and the lintel. And when the angel of death came upon the households of the people of Israel, any of uh, the people of Egypt, any Israelite who had their doorpost and their lintel touched with the blood, it passed over the angel of death, passed over them, and no one died. And that was a shadow and type of Jesus. And that those who hide themselves in Jesus and have the blood of Jesus Christ in that sense that cleanses them from all sin, that when the day of judgment comes, the angel of death will pass over. The judgment will pass over them because they will not be destroyed, they will not be carried away with the wicked because they have trusted in the Lord and in his finished work. For example, if you take the sacrificial system in the Bible, and I'm one who said, I can't stand reading all the time about kill this animal, kill that animal. Not that I'm an animal rights campaign or anything like that, but I just don't like all of the sacrifice things and you've got to do this type and kill this one this way and do it this way and it's got to be without blemish and all of these things. But the sacrificial system, every time you read it, it's a bit boring. You, re you remind yourself that it all speaks of the coming Lamb of God who would offer his life as a sacrifice for sin. So whether it was a bull being sacrificed as a sin offering, whether it was a lamb being sacrificed as a sin offering, whether it was a scapegoat being released, all of these things in the Old Testament all pointed to Jesus, who would be the Lamb of God, who would offer himself perfectly, without blemish, as a sacrifice for sin. The high priest, for example, in the Old, in the Old Testament, he was a type of Jesus, our great high priest who was to come. The tabernacle, the temple, all of the contents all pointed to Jesus who came and tabernacled among us, who in turn would make Christians temples of his Holy Spirit, signifying the eternal truth of God, that we would be dwelling with him because he is dwelling in us. Do you know where it says in Revelation 3 and verse 20, and I know it's a letter to the church, but you can apply it to the individual. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears me knock and the door opens that door, I will come in and dine with them and they, they with me. That is the eternal truth. That is the promise that God had from the beginning. That if we open up our heart, open up the door of our heart and receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, he will come in and dine with us and the promise is, and we with him. That's something that we're, we're looking forward to. All of these things in the Old Testament all pointed to something more glorious to come. The tabernacle and temple, all of its contents, speak of Jesus who tabern tabernacled among us, who 
became the temple of God in whom, the, uh, somebody writes, in whom all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And he, in turn, would make you and I, born again Christians, in the temples of his Holy Spirit, signifying, signifying this eternal truth, I'm driving us home for a point here. God dwelling with us and us forever with the Lord. And isn't it interesting that when you speak of the armor of God in the Bible, people immediately go to Ephesians chapter 6. How many people read about the armor of God in Isaiah 59? Do you remember something that you see in the Old Testament? signify or be a shadow or type of something more glorious to come. And so here in Isaiah 59 we see the Lord himself clothing himself in the very same armour that he later tells us through the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 6 that we too must put on. And he said, look, do as I do. I am your father. You are to be like me. You do as I do. In defense of justice, in defense of glory, the Lord clothes himself in armor to oppose his enemies and to recompense and to repay them for their rejection of him and his ways. But because of his patient endurance, because of the Lord's willingness that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance, God may at times seem slow to act. But he will always, always defend his justice and, his, and the glory of his name. And he will ultimately, ultimately destroy his enemies. That is, those who rebel against him, who reject him, and who rob him of glory. That is another eternal truth. So Christian, as I've said, you are called to be like your father. You are to be strong in the Lord. You are to be strong in, in the Lord and in the power of his might. Everything that you do in your Christian life must find its root in Jesus. Don't try to do it if it is not rooted in Jesus. Every battle that you encounter must be fought in the strength of Jesus. Don't even try to overcome in your own strength because you cannot do it. You must be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might and put on the whole armour of God and stand up for justice. Guard the gospel and glorify God's name. The Lord has called you Christian. The Lord has called you to guard, to proclaim the gospel, to resist the devil and to stand up for truth. Now let me be clear. Christian, you are not... Listen, you are not under any circumstances, you are not guarding the gospel if your life is one of critical contradiction. That means if you talk the talk, but you don't walk the walk. Please hear that. You are not guarding the gospel. God has told you, put on the whole armor of God for my glory's sake. For my name's sake, defend the gospel by proclaiming it, by living it. But you are not doing that if your life is one of critical contradiction. I condemned myself through the week as I was preparing this. said, oh my goodness, all of the flaws, all of the sin, all of the hang-ups, all of the mistakes, all of the feelings in my own life. Criticizing myself, thinking, is my life one of critical contradiction? But you know what? It is only the eyes of the Lord that matter. And it's what he sees that matters. It's not about what other people say. Don't get me wrong. Other people are very quick to tell you. And very often they're 100% right. Call yourself a Christian. Sure, you're doing this. Call yourself a Christian. You're a flippin' hypocrite. I don't want an end to do with Christianity if that's what Christianity is about, the way you live. People can be right and God can allow them to criticize us like that and make our lives one of critical contradiction. And then God is saying to you, see when you're living like that, you are not guarding the gospel. You are not guarding the glory of my name. Oh God, please keep me safe. Please Lord, don't let me lose my salvation. Yeah, guard my glory. I don't know what I'll think about it. Now you're guarding God's glory. Does not 
basically <laughs> decide whether you're going to heaven or not. The finished work of Jesus Christ decides whether you're going to heaven or not. And faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ decides whether you're going to heaven or not. But God in God's glory will decide what reward you get. Well, we know best. We know that we best guard the gospel when we live it. When we demonstrate it. When we gossip it in its right sense. When we proclaim it in all of its truth. What the devil is trying to do, he's trying to suppress the gospel. He's trying to keep the gospel down. He doesn't want the good news out there to tell unbelievers that they too can be saved. He doesn't want unbelievers to know that there's forgiveness with, with God for them for all of their sin. He doesn't want unbelievers to know that there is a heaven to be gained and a hell to be shown. He doesn't want people to know the gospel. So he will try to keep the gospel suppressed in your life. He will try to stop you from guarding the gospel. But the best way to guard the gospel is to live it. It's to demonstrate it. It's to gossip it. It's to proclaim it in all of its truth without any dilution of it, without any pollution of it, and without compromising it whatsoever. So now let me ask you, Christian, be very careful how you nod your head. Are you guarding the gospel? Are you guarding the glory of God's name? Are you glorifying the Lord in your life? You know, I said last week that I don't want to spiritualize what the Apostle Paul meant uh, when he tells Christians to put on the whole armor of God. And I'm going to try to avoid, because I get people that's like, you know, they spiritualize everything. I remember hearing somebody say, like, you know, this is very irreverent, and I hope the Lord's not going to strike me dead for a Maybe Billy Collier or somebody said, you know, Christians can spiritualize everything. And so they said, one thief on this side and one thief on this side. And Jesus in the middle, he says, it was like a jam sandwich. So you have one here and one here and Jesus in the middle. And Jesus was like the jam because of the blood being poured out. But there, there's a, a really irreverent way of spiritualizing. Christians are desperate for spiritualizing and blowing <coughs> out of proportion simple truths that God is trying to proclaim. Pardon me. So when the Apostle Paul says these words, Probably he had in his mind an image of a Roman soldier because he would have seen them on a daily basis. So he probably had an image of a Roman soldier in his mind when he was penning these words. And he writes, Stand therefore. Now we just skirt right over that straight away and go into the next word. But you've got to understand where Paul is coming from. When he's saying, Stand therefore, he's saying to the Christian, Stand therefore. Therefore, it means abide. It's not just mean to stand once and then after we went move somewhere else. It doesn't mean that. It means abide. It means be established. It means be deeply, deeply rooted. It means for goodness sake, take a stance in life. It means be absolutely resolute. It means be unyielding. It means be absolutely uncompromising. Stand therefore, Paul says, having girded your waist with truth, or as the NIV puts it, with the belt of truth buckled round your waist. So he's telling us, you've got to take a stand in life. If you are a Christian, you are supposed to be a person who is taking a stand. You are supposed to be standing and though all of the world is coming against you, you take your stand and you deeply root yourself in Christ Jesus and you are unyielding. And even though the world comes against you, the flesh comes against you and the devil comes against you, he says, oh, you don't need to do that compromise. Sure, you can be all right if you do that. God still loves you. You take your stand and say, no, no. I am standing up for Jesus. Paul says, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, or with the belt of truth, buckled round your waist, having on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, he says, taking the shield of faith and the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And so what he's basically telling us is a Roman soldier's battle outfit was a belt, which was around this area. It was a breastplate. It was shoes that came up with the the leather things up over his shoes. It was a shield. It was a helmet. And it was a sword. That is the basics. 
of the Roman soldiers' military outfit. And Paul says to Christians, the Christian's battle attire, the, the Christian's battle outfit is similar. But clearly, clearly, you and I know, because like, I've got a belt on, but it's not the belt of truth. I don't have any breastplate on here this morning. I've no shield with me. I've no sword. So clearly what Paul is saying is that the Christian's battle attire is similar, but with spiritual significance. This is the something glorious. This is the something greater that we see in Isaiah chapter 59 when God was putting on his armor and telling us to put on the armor. It's something even more glorious because ours is not a physical outfit that God asks us to wear. It is a spiritual outfit. It has spiritual significance. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the gospel of peace assures, it always reminds me in Isaiah where it says, how lovely on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. And you know that we can see them, the, the feet of going through the mountains from village to village to tell people the good news of Jesus. We have the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which we know is the word of God. So let's keep it really simple without spiritualizing it. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, and the word of God. And then Paul tells us, once we have put these on, having done so, he says, pray always. That is, pray without ceasing. Now, that doesn't mean that we've all to become monks and nuns and try to put ourselves into some monastery or nunnery, you know, to spend 24 hours a day every day on our knees praying. That doesn't mean that. It means be constantly in an attitude of prayer. If you're walking down, you remember Rita talking about she would walk home back and forward from work in different places, just talking to the Lord as casually as you like. That is what he's saying here. Be in a constant conversation with God. Should it be, oh Lord, isn't it lovely weather today? Oh, flip God, it's freezing today. You know, whatever it might be, but being in that attitude of being constantly communing with God, praying when someone comes to your mind, bringing them before God, when you've got some burden on your heart, you pray and ask God to move. Pray always. But here's the point. Listen to it again. Without spiritualizing this, truth, Paul says truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, and the word. Are you ready for this? Where do you find the truth of God? Who said that? What did you share? From the Bible. Somebody else, someone said something else. Jesus. Jesus. Right. Now listen. I'm going to go through these very, very quickly. Where do you find the truth of God? Jesus said, I am the way, the, the truth, and the life. So where do you find the truth of God? In Jesus. Where do you find the righteousness of God? Well, the Bible says, the righteousness of God comes to us through faith in Muhammad. No, it doesn't, praise the Lord. The righteousness of God comes to us through faith in Jesus. Where do we find the peace of God? Well, Romans tells us in Romans chapter 5, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Where do we find faith? Hebrews tells us. Faith comes from what is heard. And what is heard is the preaching of Christ Jesus. The preaching of Christ. Where do we find salvation? Salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Where do we find the word of God? Jesus is the word of God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And we go on down to chapter or 1 verse 12. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So where do we find the word of God? Jesus is 
the word of God. And so when Paul tells us, put on the whole armor of God, what is he telling us to do? He is telling us simply, put on Jesus. Clothe yourself in Jesus, who at all times must be our source of strength, particularly, as he says, in the evil day, in that moment when we come under spiritual attack and we know that that can happen at any time, anywhere. Paul is simply saying to us, without spiritualizing, he said, listen guys, put on Jesus. Put on Jesus. Now, Jesus isn't like a Mr. Globy uniform. You know, you can sort of climb and get somebody to zip you up in the morning and you're all Mr. Blobby. You can't sort of do that with Jesus and put on Jesus and get him zipped up at the back and you know, you walk down the street. But what he's saying to us is, is you've got to have the mind of Christ. You've got to think as Jesus thinks. You've got to do as Jesus does. Jesus said, I only do the things I see the Father doing. And we are to be like our Father. We are to be like also Jesus. When Jesus only did the things he saw the Father doing, we need to be only doing the things that we know Jesus is doing. That is how we glorify God. That is how we guard the gospel. So Christian, in light of that, have you put on Jesus? You see, this is one reason, and it's only one, why I argue that a born-again Christian cannot put off the armor of God. Because you just can't put off Jesus. Sadly, you can, in a sense, suppress him. You can push him. There's, oh, Jesus, you're not getting out today because I don't really want to live as a Christian today because you know I'm going to so and so to do this and I'm going to do that. So, and you suppress him. And you suppress Jesus in your life. Or another way that Paul puts it is you quench the work of the Holy Spirit. Or, or you, you, you're an obstacle to what God wants to do. Have you put on Jesus? Personally, I don't believe a born-again Christian, as I said, can put off the armour of God because we can't put off Jesus. We are in Jesus and Jesus is in us. But Jesus must always be our source of strength and confidence. The devil seeks to deceive, to dupe, to entice and to seduce us away from the Lord and to get our eyes off Jesus so that the Lord is robbed of glory and we are robbed of God's blessings. The devil knows, he knows that if he can deceive us away from our position of strength in Christ, we will be vulnerable and prone to stumbling and falling and robbing God of glory. <clears throat> and so Christian, you need to know your enemy and how he operates. And I don't mean just from this 20, 20, 21 weeks. You need to know him on a daily basis. You need to know your enemy on an hourly basis. You need to have this be prepared for every eventuality mentality. You have been <coughs> born again into a spiritual battle, but you don't enter the battle alone. You have allies and you have associated powers to help you. God has also given you powerful spiritual weapons to help you resist the devil and his ploys. And you have been given full body, soul and spirit armor to protect you. But every Christian, as I said, must develop a be prepared for every eventuality mentality and pray always because our enemy can strike anytime, anywhere. Now let me put this to you and it's harsh. Don't go gunning to God when you've fallen into sin and you feel crap and the enemy's coming against you and making you feel, oh, I'm a terrible person. Don't go gunning to God about this. Oh, God, this is terrible. Ask yourself before you go to God, did you put on the whole armour of God? Did you pray without ceasing? Did you apply the powerful weapons that God has given you to resist the devil? Did you call upon your allies and your associated powers to help you at that time? Because God says there is no temptation comes your way that he does not provide a means for you to escape it. So it's no good going to God and say, oh God, oh I don't know why did you let this happen? God's not interested. He's going to say to you, did you put on the armor of God? Did you stand in my strength 
Did you stand in my power? Did you trust in me? Did you find your source of strength in me? Did you hide yourself under the shadow of my wings? Did you pray? Were you praying before you even entertained that thought about sin? And when you did entertain the thought, did you pray to have it driven out or for it to be taken captive? Did you use the powerful weapons that I have given you? Did you have a be prepared for every eventuality mentality? But let's, let, let me just also say, we're all going to sin. We're all going to fall short. But if you're repeatedly walking in sin, I've got to question, and you have got to question, are you glorifying the Lord? Are you guarding the gospel? Are you applying the armor? Are you using the weapons? And are you looking to God for strength and to him alone? In the Old Testament, God clothed himself in battle attire to oppose his enemies and to repay them for their rejection of him and his ways. And let me be clear, God is unchanging. He will do the same in these last days. And I'll say it again. In the Old Testament, God clothed himself in battle attire to oppose his enemies and to repay them for their rejection of him and for their rejection of his ways. And he will do the same in these last days. Christians, therefore, must follow the Lord's example and do what he says. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Remember, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, to abide in God, to abide in Jesus, to be resolute in Jesus, to be established in Jesus, to be unyielding in Jesus, to be uncompromising in Jesus. Christian, know your enemy. Better still, know Jesus more. Know Jesus more. In conclusion of this part of our statement of faith, I declare that Shiloh Christian Fellowship believes in the person of the devil and his opposition to God and his saints. But greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Maybe there's someone this morning here or watching in and you're not yet a Christian. Well, let me just remind you, the devil and demons are real. And they are working to prevent you from knowing God and from getting saved. If you do not waken up to this truth, the devil will deceive you into hell. And therefore this morning I plead with you, please believe God's word. The devil is a deceiver, he is a liar, he is the father of lies. I plead with you, believe God's word and do what he says. Confess your sin, agree with God that you are a sinner. Repent, turn around and turn away from living <coughs> pardon me, your sinful lifestyle and trust in Jesus and in Jesus alone to save you. It is time to stop the devil robbing God of glory and robbing you of God's blessings. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, this morning we want to thank you that as we conclude this series on the person of the devil and his opposition to you, Lord, and to your saints. We thank you for the teaching that you have given to us, Lord God, that we must always find our source of strength in Jesus. We cannot resist the world, the flesh, and the devil in our own strength or in our own might. We must hide ourselves in you. We must learn, Lord God, to use the powerful weapons of warfare that you have given us. But even they, Lord God, their power is only effective when we realize that their power is in the person of Jesus. We need, Lord God, to be a people who understand what it means to put on the whole armor of God. 
And we want, Lord, please, to be a people who walk in that armour and who live such a way, Lord God, that we guard the gospel, that we defend the gospel, that we don't pollute it, dilute it, or compromise it. But by doing so, Lord, we bring you glory through our lives. And Lord, even when we do succumb to the enemy's deceits, even when his ploys at times overcome us and we fall into sin, Thank you that we know, Father, you love us and that we can come to you and your word promises that if we confess our sin, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and put our feet back on the right track. Help us, Lord, please, to be a people who do that, who don't suppress the working of your spirit, who don't suppress, in that sense, the Lord Jesus in us. But you, Father, lead us in the right ways and help us to be just like you to put on the armour of God and having done so to stand firm, to be established in Jesus. Though all hell endeavour to shake us, help us to stand firm in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour, all to the glory of God our Father. Lord, help us to have a be prepared for every eventuality mentality so that we would be wise to the deceit of the devil, so that we would know our enemy and know how to resist him. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.